Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Hydrogen from Biomass webinar. Uh, although we are in the third week of 2022, I take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy and a prosperous new year. And we are delighted uh, to have such an eminent list of panelists, both from the academia and industry, uh, who are working on the path to create a biomass to hydrogen based economy. Uh, I know Pawan has already, uh, we've had like an informal introduction uh, session, but uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce our panelists today. We have uh, Dr. Professor S. Dasapa, Chair uh, of the Interdisciplinary Center for Energy Research, Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru. Dr. Pritam Singh, Associate Professor, Indian Institute of Technology, Benares Hindu University. Mr. T. Ramachandran, who is the Technical Director of Decentralized Energy Systems India Private Limited, or uh, better known as Desi Power. Dr. Kiara Zinaro, who is the head of, of Heat and Green Gas Lead at Renewable Energy Association, London. Mr. Rajesh Deshpande, who is the Managing Director of Energetic Consulting Private Limited. And uh, we have from WRI, our uh, executive director, Mr. Madhav Pai, Ms. Krishnaveni Maladi, who is our consultant within the hydrogen program, WRI India. Dr. Guncha Munjal, who is the manager within the hydrogen WRI India team. Anurag and uh, Soham, who are uh, also within the hydrogen program uh, in the WRI India team. And our director, Mr. Pawan Mulukutla, uh, who will be uh, moderating today's session. Uh, before we start, uh, just to may ensure that all of us uh, are within our time limits for the presentation, I will be ringing uh, an alert uh, bell, uh, which will uh, you know, give you that one minute is left of your presentation. And, uh, and I hope you all have a very engaging and fruitful uh, discussion today. Over to you, Madhav, to set the stage for this webinar. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Anandita. Uh, good afternoon to all, all our participants and welcome to all our panelists. Uh, we are really look forward to an exciting webinar. Uh, just to set context a little bit uh, for the conversation today, you know, you know, as part of this whole conversation on low carbon, carbon neutral world, all of the commitments now that India has made uh, at, in Glasgow, uh, you know, we, we, you know, hydrogen is gain, been gaining a lot of attention, right? It is emerging as a technology uh, that can drive, that has the potential to drive deep decarbonization in industry, in transport and energy sectors. Uh, also what, I mean, for, for, from an India perspective, I think uh, today as a nation, we are in a place where, you know, as this technology is emerging, we can really compete for a place in the global hydrogen economy. And we can, in many ways, do that, you know, trying to evolve our own indigenous sort of methods and ideas and realities, right? So uh, today, you know, most current technologies for making low carbon hydrogen, green hydrogen, either as a feedstock for or for power are based on electrolysis. And, you know, electrolysis, as a process consumes large quantities of water. And, uh, you know, for a you know similar issue with like even ethanol, anything that competes on food or water in India, right, is something that we have to really, really be very, very careful about. Because as a country, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, with the density of population we have, I think fresh water, food are absolutely critical issues for us to, to, to sort of conserve and make the smartest dis decisions on. So I think in that context, I think, uh, you know, given that, uh, you know, for low carbon pathways for hydrogen production, you know, India can really capitalize on, on our sort of agro-based economy. You know, we generate lots of biomass. I mean, I would look to the experts here to sort of, uh, you know, speak about the figures of how many millions of tons of biomass we generate. Uh, and, you know, we know what happens to the biomass every year, you know, farm burning. We hear the stories from North India, from Punjab and Haryana. But I mean, I live in Mumbai and all around Mumbai, we see biomass burning 
and clearly november december the poor air quality that we all see uh, you know comes from this biomass burning so i think there is also a huge opportunity to actually create this economy uh, around the biomass that can be used then for hydrogen production so um, so i mean i think with this opportunity i mean at wri india we have been focusing on understanding the opportunities that a low carbon pathway for biomass uh can present for an you know in in sort of uh, low carbon hydrogen path, pathway using biomass and how it can sort of work for the agro based economy like india our team has been involved uh, in sort of various research um, you know uh, fronts on biomass for hydrogen including like value chain life cycle assessments looking at biogasification technologies we doing some comparative comparative assessments with existing uh, uh, sort of electrolysis technologies um etc so i mean i think uh, uh, you know today what we are going to do is we are joined by leading academicians and industry leaders that are working extensively across various segments of biomass value chain uh, they will share their experience their knowledge uh, in the biomass sector and and through this webinar you know we hope to shed some light on policy regulatory uh, you know techno economic considerations to sort of scale this low carbon hydrogen pathway the pathway for hydrogen uh, to commercial level so so you know biomass for hydrogen you know holds an immense potential i think uh, in many ways we can drive in sort of a inclusive model for decarbonization uh, you know by establishing a biomass based hydrogen ecosystem and i think um, i think it will really uh, you know drive this sort of inclusive low carbon growth conversation that we are also all very keen on driving so with this um, i would uh, hand it over to pawan to moderate the conversation again welcome uh, uh, to all our panelists really look forward to hearing from you and uh, hope all the participants uh, you have a very enriching sort of uh, webinar experience with us over the next hour and a half so over to you pawan thank you everyone yeah i think anandita has the flow so anandita why don't you go ahead <clears throat> yeah sure uh, krishna veni uh, would request you to start off uh, with your presentation on biomass uh, to hydrogen yeah thank you anandita anurag could you please share the screen good afternoon distinguished guest uh, panelist and uh, dear audience so i'm just going to give an outline of what exactly is like you know the hydrogen from biomass and uh, how are we like you know presently there and our experts will be telling more in detail where the technology is and uh, how what policy we need to implement So just one second we uh, anurag is just sharing the screen hold on anurag you are the host now go ahead and share the screen yeah thank you thank you anurag so uh, so as i was talking about like you know hydrogen from biomass so uh, to let uh, to tell like hydrogen holds uh, potential to decarbonize different sectors as we all know and it also can help in mitigating uh, like you know the global warming today hydrogen is predominantly produced through methane reformation and coal gasification hydrogen production through biomass can also be a good alternative for agriculture country like india and being a carbon neutral process uh, it can like you know it can help in reducing the air pollution that need to be addressed and also it can add to a additional income to our farmers so uh, next slide please anurag can you just go full slide uh, full screen yeah yeah this slide is telling about the what is the bioavailability we have and the biomass that is available in the country so surplus agri residue that we have is around 170 million tons and from the pie graph that uh, that is projected here you can see that uh, the major crops like rice wheat sugarcane nearly contribute to about 50% of the agri residue 
Beside the agri residue that we have, we even have the forest residues, which account for almost 100 million tons, and uh, municipal solid waste, which again account for another 60 million tons. Can I have the next slide, please? This is a slide where we are like trying to show through the heat map the spatial distribution of uh, the agro uh, agro biomass residue that is available in the country and also the municipal solid waste we can see from the projections like you know certain states are having the high potential to produce hydrogen from the biomass and uh, like you can see ivory stands for the low potential and the dark green in case of agri biomass it stands for the the dark green stands for the high potential. Similarly, is a case with municipal solid waste, where ivory is, stands for the low potential, and uh, uh, dark brown stands for the uh, high potential for the production of hydrogen from uh, municipal solid waste. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, according to estimates, like uh, by 2030, India's annual demand for hydrogen in the country would be around like you know 25 to 30 million tons and from the present technology that we have for the hydrogen through biomass we can see that around 20 to 25 million tons can be supported by the biomass itself for uh, for the production of hydrogen and uh, also beside this we also have advantage with this technology is that technology is already available with us which has a trl scale of about uh, seven to eight then we have surplus biomass so we don't have to like you know go ahead with something additional for that and then there is no rare metals that are to be used in other processes like electrolysis and even the water stress is not there with us so i think uh, uh, this is what like we have the potential presently our country. Can I have the next slide, Anura? Yeah, these are the pathways that like, you know, is there for the production of hydrogen from biomass. Typically, we have thermochemicals where uh, it uses heat to produce the hydrogen. And then we have biological where microorganisms are involved to produce enzymes and through that we get hydrogen. And electrochemical where we have electrolysis of the feedstock takes place and the hydrogen comes out. From this, like, you know, the thermochemical process is the most advanced technology that is presently there. and uh, you can also see the TRL scales and the hydrogen yield that are depicted in the slide. And from the TRL scale, we can see that gasification and pyrolysis holds like, you know, it's the, at this point, they are the most viable commercially available technology. And I think uh, rest of it can also be like, you know, they can come viable at years to come. Can I have the next slide? some of the factors that affects the hydrogen yield through this process of high, uh, hydrogen production through biomass is the type of uh, biomass that we have, the particle size, then the catalyst that can be used in the process, sometimes is a temperature and light intensity in case of fermentation. And even in gasification, we have steam to biomass ratio. So these factors certainly like, you know, it uh, affects the yield of hydrogen from biomass. Can I have the next slide? This slide shows like, you know, the we have done some work and we can see that already in GLOBE, uh, you can see that uh, so much work is already going on for uh, production of hydrogen from biomass, like countries like UK, USA, and EU, Australia are already in like, you know, they have already initiated the work for the production of hydrogen from biomass. So to know more about what is happening in India and to know more about the Indian scenario, let's hear to our expert panelists with regard to technology and also to what type of policies do you think should come into implementation for encouraging hydrogen from production, uh, hydrogen production from biomass. Thank you. Thank you, Anandita, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Krishnaveni. Uh, would request Dr. Dasapa to please uh, present uh, his findings. Sure, thank you. Uh, I hope I have the sharing sharing uh, capabilities. Can you please uh, allow me to share my screen? 
Dr. Dasapal, he has made you co-host and if you could... Yeah, that's fine. Now, now I have got the thing, yes. And your video is not turned on, so if you could turn on your video. I will do that one. I think I okay. just just to make sure that uh, there is enough bandwidth. I thought I should just. It's okay now. Uh, can you see see my slides? Yes, sir. We can. Yes, yes, we can. Now, uh, can you hear me too? Yes. Yeah. Thank yes, you very much and. Uh, uh, I should uh, thank uh, WRI for really creating this uh, platform just to talk about hydrogen and in a context and at the time wherein people have been looking at uh, hydrogen as, as, a, as a source for all our motive and try to make sure that we get uh, uh, the, the necessary climate change commitments what has been done. What I'm going to speak to you is related to some work what we had uh, we had done earlier and which has led into what we today call probably one of this uh, green hydrogen generation processes what we have been looking at and just to uh, put something on biomass in context with with the large audience who are there i would be more than happy to receive any inputs on these things we completely missed on biomass to power in the earlier uh, maybe couple of decades i think we really replicated what the West was trying to do in terms of trying to bring in bigger power generation packages to the country, which we probably we don't require. We could have really dealt with small and medium very well and we could have become leaders. Unfortunately, we did not really take that pathway. And today, every time you look at any of these power generation systems, they say biomass is not available. And in the context with this, uh, wherein we, I'll just show you some, some insights about what is small uh, power level packages, what we have been working, we had worked on, and today still it's available. Hydrogen machine was launched uh, recently, and in fact, the emphasis is mostly on uh, green hydrogen. And I, I, I had an opportunity to be part of the R&D leads to set up something on hydrogen mission for the country. I can tell you that it really was not easy to see whether biomass would get some share to showcase itself uh, as an important component in the entire hydrogen mission. With, with great difficulty, we have pushed that into the system so that we, we will be doing something on biomass. And now over the last at least uh, half a decade or a de at least half a decade, there are professional players coming into biomass sector. It's very, very encouraging. Uh, I, I suppose that uh, biomass will not lose its, uh, its, its charm uh, this time because we can really become biorefineries like petrochemical refineries to look at biomass to fuels and chemicals. And the standard questions, I want many of the people who are participating here and the professionals who have been involved. One simple question which I have been answering for the last two, three decades is only where is biomass and hope this gets answered now so that the appropriate people at the appropriate level will get the right answer so that this also this sector also gets nurtured just to introduce the technology i think uh, we did develop a power generation package probably the best across the globe uh, on converting solid fuel to gaseous fuel and it could really power an internal combustion engine the best way to use biomass for small power up to about 1 to 2 megawatt level very very efficient in terms of conversion processes and probably was a state of the art in terms of its technology. In fact, uh, we were somebody who really transferred technology, not simply give a, giving a products to somebody across the globe, including GE in the US, we did the technology transfer, unfortunately, because of some shakeup which took place in the, the top board level in, 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 in the GE. Uh, they did ship one system to uh, US, but uh, it has taken a slightly lower priority right now. And probably this was one of the best technologies. And the reason why I need to say it is probably because typically the technology transfers from north to south. Here we were able to do from south to north. You could see these, all these are all intellectually put everything, everything designed at the institute and try to use the licenses to set up something which happened in, in Switzerland using a GE Anbaker engine. This is again a Wakusha engine of GE. And most of these contributions are both in terms of technologically on gasification and also trying to develop necessary packages for 
operating the engine using producer gas yeah we did uh, give a technology on term in terms of trying to see how producer gas can become a fuel there we did as a part of a collaborative research we did ship uh, the entire complete system to italy this is another licensee in japan who we, to whom we did transfer the technology is a very nice cute looking 250 kilowatt package coupled to an internal combustion and this is the system which i mentioned about a megawatt level which was shipped to us and we also did a range of activities for island and operations kind of city this was one of those islands in cuba where we did develop this one while all this recipe was what i am trying to show is what has happened outside india within india we had more than about uh, 30000 liters of oil being saved on a daily basis that was a huge contribution which was done both in terms of power generation we did develop technologies for cummins in terms of converting all their engines and also we did some work with respect to tata motors to see we can convert all the natural gas engine to operate and produce the gas probably then this was the only indigenous technology which was made available to everybody in this country and while we could not see so much as what was happening in the other renewable energy sector for biomass somewhere we thought should we do something to uh, bring in value addition for uh, the so called hydrogen which we uh, biomass worldwide people were talking about uh, fuel cell and finally you go back you will see only hydrogen from uh, fossil fuels and ammonia production 50% refinery applications 22% methanol production 14% and uh, other reduction process about 7 percent standard process which was used is uh, being uh, the smr process if you really look at the typical overall uh, generation from natural gas is 50 percent of the lhv value is right from 0.15 to about 50 megawatt range and up to about 85 percent in the 150 to 300 megawatt range so i think these are the very large scale systems which people are trying to do if you really look break the entire process into simple things what many a times people will understand in order to generate 1 kg of uh, hydrogen this is uh, at uh, some uh, medium scale kind of you need about 4 4 1/2 kg of uh, natural gas and you know that many of you know that what are kind of co2 which footprint which produces keeping many of these things mind as you rightly said at a low at a very large capacity you are at 3.2 kg otherwise you go to about 4.5 kg uh, thing out of which maybe if you really look at chemically it is only two but i think this is the other other energy which has to make sure that uh, you have to run the system when people have been talking about green the one critic crit, crit, uh, clearly one person uh, one uh, one uh, thought process is only electrolysis because electricity is generated from renewables through various other route other than biomass i think i want to stress here you require about 60 kilowatts of electricity per kg of hydrogen generated and major research is going on on the on the entire process of electrolyzers and related aspect is to see that whether we can reduce the input power which goes into making people have been looking at variety of things to see whether it can come down to 40 kilowatts or 50 kilowatts something of the order of 50 50 to 60 kilowatts is being looked at and you also know that theoretically you can get about 100 times that means you need a minimum about 100 uh, about about 10 to 12 kg of water clean water to get a kg of hydrogen i am just trying to see that i think surprisingly i think nobody looks at biomass as a source of electricity for even electrolyzer this is something very surprising i think this is what is is, is this group somehow should try to see whether we can change that mindset biomass is is what i am going to convert is is a year 0.7 h2o add a carbon atom to that one this is how the biomass is being looked at there are two different process <laughs> one is the biochemical conversion through fermentation route wherein you get methane and various other things you can also get hydrogen by appropriately tuning your bio microbes biomass is through thermochemical conversion which can get into a mixture of co and h2 which can further lead to fuels chemicals and other things this is the route i will be i'm going to discuss right now and to keep some tab on what is that we achieve what is the kind of efficiencies and where we look at biomass typically is made up of carbon hydrogen oxygen basically that contributes to the entire 100% except for small fraction of other elements depend 
depend upon source of biomass what you get. And one very interesting thing, it, it's, it's also important for us to recognize is irrespective of what is the species, on an ash-free basis, you have the same oxygen, same carbon, same hydrogen content. That's something which we need to be really, really clear so that we will be able to deal with as we move forward. Just to give you simple chemistry, if I have a magic to do, I take biomass and put some moles of oxygen, some moles of water, I can get about 150 grams of hydrogen per kg of biomass. This is one, one magic which we can do. Typically, all the other power generation packages, what I showed you was using air as a gasification medium, wherein you get 20% hydrogen, 20% carbon monoxide, which would allow you to extract about 40 to 45 grams of hydrogen per kg of biomass. As against, it has about 65 grams of hydrogen per kg of biomass. I think this is all the best you can get when you are trying to do air gasification. One may question saying that uh, you can, can we separate out this hydrogen? Yes, you definitely can do, but the challenges with respect to energy which can go into separation become exceedingly high. It may not turn out to be an economic, economical proposition. What you need to do is can we eliminate nitrogen which is taking 50% of the volume? Yes, we can use oxygen instead of nitrogen. Otherwise, you will have a mixture like this. And is there a possibility to do a bit of work on the carbon to see whether we can get hydrogen? That can be done through steam. That's what the process at Institute of Science looks at. You have a carbon hydrogen matrix from biomass. You also have the oxygen and uh, steam coming out, and which will allow you to control various process parameters to write from 25% hydrogen to you can go up to 50% hydrogen. And you have a range of carbon monoxide, everything, whatever is required as a technology. And with this, we have been able to get close to about 100 grams of hydrogen per kg of biomass. That means you have been able to generate a little more of hydrogen than what was available in the, in the biomass per se as an element. This is just to give you a control parameter which will allow you to control the process in such a way that hydrogen percentage can increase from 30% to about 50-55%. That's possible. Carbon monoxide can come down from close to 30% to about close to about 7-8%. And similarly, some CO2 will increase. A small fraction of methane is always there. This contains a range of uh, biomass, wood chips, coconut shells, which is very dense material, and corn cobs. You will not see a distinction, I think. This, these are going to give you some indications about what, what is that control parameter, what kind of compositions you get. They make, I mean, you see some small differences, which, which could be very, very, thing. if you change the control parameter from one, to other number, you see changes which do occur with respect to the, the overall gas composition, which will allow us to get into what is called as a table wherein you will be able to look at yield of hydrogen per, per kg of biomass increases. You, you also have another very important control parameter, H2 to CO ratio, which can be used for a, a range of applications downstream if you want to get into chemicals, if you want to get into methanol, and a, a range of things, whatever is required to be done, especially people who have been talking about uh, ammonia and other things, we have a con complete conversion uh, control which we will be able to deal with this one. I think today we have a technology which can bring many of these things, and we are also operating right at 1 kg per hour level, or our level of hydrogen to about 5 kg per hour. It's a fairly large capacity system to generate hydrogen rich syn gas and generate hydrogen on this. There were very many, many, many technical challenges which we have been able to overcome, including the separation of these things. The, the entire thing, whatever you have been doing right now, the, the testing would be only on the quality of hydrogen, what you get, especially when you want to really look at fuel cell requirements. And this is something which you need to get, 99.97 purity is what you need to get, which has to be a qualified as an ISO specification for hydrogen, which can go into PEM fuel cells. And there are more than a dozen components which, which has to be at PPP level. I think this has been a challenge over the last year, year and a half. We have been really working on this to see whether we can have measuring equipment to deal with. Nothing is existing. Today, I think we have a unique facility wherein we will be able to deal with many of the other, other things can also be dealt with, which we are trying to do with other equipments. We have almost achieved about 50 or 70% of the requirements 
while others are below that number, we do not know the precise number which will come up to that. That means today we have right from biomass to getting into the so-called PEM fuel cell hydrogen quality very, very comfortably and scaling up can be, you have seen the scale up which we have done up to about 10 and 2 tons per hour. That means getting into a few hundred kgs of hydrogen per hour should not be difficult from biomass. And just, just to give you some potential, I think something was also brought by Dr. Krishnaveni earlier. Today, if you really look at 250 million tons of surplus biomass, close to about 70 million tons of oil equivalent uh, from agro refuges and forest, uh, a 10% utilization will, will, will generate about 1.2 million tons of high green hydrogen, which is close to about 25% of current consumption. And this, this will give you a measure of what needs to be important how do we take it to the next stage? I think this is something which, which people across the sector should really look at and try to see. Other than that, it also mitigates the pain. The, way, the other very important thing which people have been talking about is the kg of CO2 per kg of hydrogen, which is, which is supposed to be generating. When you go through coal gasification, you have a certain things which you couple with the carbon capture, it can be brought down to this level. I think these are all technologies which, which still has to be really looked at. If you look, really look at uh, SMRs, which generates about, about 10 kg of hydrogen per kg of, uh, 10 kg of CO2 per kg of biomass, if you really go through the gas capture, you will try to bring out, and people have been looking at economics, what needs to be done, how to take care of this, and all the oil sector is trying to do. Whenever we want to really look at green hydrogen, only one source which comes to most of the people, including the the policy makers is only electrolysis using renewable energy or when you say renewable energy, it's biomass is not even considered. But with the root what I mentioned, we can really fix carbon further. This is going to be negative in terms of carbon. That's what we can show when you put a technology through thermochemical conversion directly into hydrogen. This is definitely a possibility. And way forward, we can really look at uh, decarbonizing steel and fertilizers. Definitely we can really look at and MSW is a very, very strong potential for using this to bring in value addition for, for the kind of activities which it is. I thought it, it would be good for this, this audience to see debate on, on some points where, wherein I put a SWOT analysis from biomass to hydrogen. It's going to be strengths or it's going to be a decentralized Probably we, we have we always been talking about self-reliance and uh, I think this really will make sure that we are we are uh, in that sector, environmentally sound as long as you put the te technology. It's a locally available materials and it will be able to replace many of the locally available fossil fuel requirements. It's an indigenous technology directly from biomass to hydrogen. Hybridization with other renewables can really become, whether you use gasification or power generation, can really, really become a very, very nice, important uh, area to exp uh, explore. And employment potential is there, which is all in the in the charter of government of India's various things. What are the opportunities? Yes, then it's completely atmanirbar. We can really do whatever is required. To, at least the fuel linkages is there. We don't have to depend on any external source. Potential is very high. Distributed concept, small is beautiful, can be really looked at. Gestation period is nearly zero. Hydrogen generation costs are comparable to that of uh, fossil fuel system, which is definitely possible. And it supports the GOI's initiatives on green ammonia and urea very, very clearly. The weaknesses are very, very strong. There is no level playing field for biomass in this country, right from power generation till now. It's, and they say fuel is extremely dispersed. We do not know. And they, everybody is looking at large scale systems, replicating what the West can do. And our agro-based economy is very different compared to the West, where most of it is done centralized here. Everything is distributed. We had a large, uh, eye openers when we did the biomass atlas for this country at, from Institute of Science. Biomass is generated at one location, crop is generated, biomass is generated elsewhere. I think these are all very, very important things which need to be uh, kept in mind. Not many players in this system. It's a low visibility and because it's completely indigenous technology, we don't have any mechanisms to see how it can be pushed through. I think now this forum should be able to take it to the next stage. Threats are very, very clear. Reforms underemphasized biomass-based system no access to towards level playing field. With this, uh, I thank you for your attention. We'll be very happy to answer any questions or discussions as we move forward. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Dasapa. So we have some questions. Um, what we will do is we'll quickly go through the other presentations uh, and come back uh, for a panel discussions. Also, in the meantime, the chat window, there have been a lot of questions that are being asked. For instance, Pankaj, uh, uh, Mr. Pankaj Pakatel just asked about the oxy steam process and other things. So if you want to respond um, towards the end, we can take up. But back to you, Anandita, um, uh, over to the next presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dasapa, for the very insightful presentation. Uh, I request Dr. Desh, uh, Mr. Desh Pandey to uh, please uh, uh, make his presentation. And I will uh, sound uh, a bell uh, a minute before your presentation, sir. Uh, surely. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. So, uh, after a very nice, insightful presentation by Dr. Dasapa, uh, I'm just going to browse through some of the aspects of biomass uh, to hydrogen and then move to my main area of interest and in discussion today, that is uh, the principal solid waste. So point number one, uh, obviously, is why is this we are looking at from anywhere? Because the color of hydrogen from biomass is not yet defined. So green hydrogen definition is not including biomass or FSW. Now the reasons are we have reasonably proven technology of gasify, gasification commercial available. And like Dr. Dasapa said, we actually have a complete plant with uh, gasification to power with biomass or MSW. So we are, we are running it. The cost of hydrogen can be brought down significantly in CapEx and OpEx with this route. And it can definitely fulfill India's dream scheme for decentralized hydrogen generation. And the hydrogen generation at point of use is the, is the key. Where is the potential market is another good question one must really look at. The potential market uh, is, is not where thermal energy is. The potential market is probably for the, uh, for the heavy and light vehicle use, fuel sale to substitute DG site. Domestic and commercial kitchens uh, where we are using LPG and PND can be substituted. Now, fertilizer industry is going to have a nose drive turn. It's a paradigm shift the moment this technology is emerged because today they are completely dependent on SMR, uh, steam methane uh, uh, reforming as a starting point. And the starting point itself is going to change when we have syngas available from biomass gasification. So, Biomass to urea in a decentralized mode. A farmer makes biomass, biomax may, makes urea, and urea goes back to the farmer. So in a 100 kilometer radius, the whole urea business can be done and over. We have worked extensively on that uh, with very little on-ground output. But that's something which we have really passionately worked on. Polymer industry uh, can have an alternate through methanol or other sources. Quickly looking at what are the challenges, availability of biomass, bulk production, transportation, and we will discuss these issues in future. Uh, as against, if you see MSW, municipal solid waste is abundant. It does not have a cohesive composition. So the impurity risk is high. Committed supply of MSW from municipal corporations is available. The technologies are which are feasible at smaller scale are not commercially available. So that's a challenge for everyone. What is possible with uh, MSW? Any material which is carrying carbon, whether it is plastic, paper, or cellulose, can be converted to syngas, which is a combination of CO2, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen, some portion of methane. So several chemicals can be made out of this syngas. I mean, this one slide covers it all. Syngas can be used for power generation, which can be in one route. Syngas can give hydrogen, which can be stored in the form of ammonia or used as chemical or fuel cell. Syngas can give methanol, which is the genesis for the entire petrochemical industry. And Syngas to methanol is successfully demonstrated project uh, from coal gasification. Syngas and Syngas to methanol are demonstrated projects uh, world over, in particularly in China. And in, in India, we do have syngas to methanol now coming up as a part. Now, looking at the time frame, I would just like to quickly go through what is possible. Uh, NTPC Netra, where Guncha Madam comes from, 
Uh, we are doing a project which is under completion now, which is under erection, where municipal solid waste, which is available in the wet mixed form, will be converted to syngas, which will generate power, and that power will generate hydrogen. So roughly 100 tons per day of wet municipal solid waste as a received basis will generate around 50 tons per day of rich derived fuel that is RDF, which will generate net about 50 megawatt hours uh, per day of power. And the hydrogen by electrolysis route will be in the range of 0.8 to 1 tons per day. Now, what we are doing today is a 600 kilowatt power generation, where 400 kilowatt will be net export of power, which will generate 8 kgs of hydrogen. So this plant is completely in physical, you know, uh, position. We are. Sorry, this is the uh, this is the plant which we are now doing at uh, uh, Netra MSW2 power. Similar plant we have already executed at Infar Manipur, where we take municipal solid waste and we give power. Power and hydrogen would be the next step done in NTPC. The plant is under erection. So whatever Dr. Dasgupta was saying in physical form is being executed. The possibilities of processing of municipal solid waste to hydrogen. Uh, obviously are many and we are working on oxy steam gasification of biomass and municipal solid waste to get these variety of chemicals as the parlance can be seen from uh, this part here the msw through the gasification route and several chemical reactions finally can lead to methanol and hydrogen hydrogen and carbon dioxide uh, mind you, carbon dioxide is not a very happy to have uh, chemical in the air, but carbon dioxide is a very happy to have chemical in uh, various forms of, uh, you know, food industry. One of the industries, is of course, the, the carbon dioxide we do drink through the aerated uh, soft drinks. So carbon dioxide here will be in captured form, not released to atmosphere. So... This is something which is MSW to give. Again, this is a chemical route. Uh, synth gas, synth gas followed by a shift reaction and shift reaction by uh, followed by a carbon capture. Uh, the municipal solid waste can be converted to ethanol and carbon dioxide. Now, obviously, the processes have other chemicals, catalysts, products and byproducts are primarily water. So, uh, like in this process, we add water. In this process, we get water. MSW can be replaced with biomass. It is more convenient to use biomass instead of municipal solid waste. Uh, these are absolutely doable processes. Uh, they have a good amount of support from theory. And like Dr. Dasgupta said, this is something we should have done long back. And now we are probably reinventing something which was available um, probably in 1940s, where we could have adopted that model of development, but uh, today we are looking at it. And this methanol, mind you, uh, is a genesis of most of the chemicals. And uh, like what we saw, this methanol can give formaldehyde, it can give polythene, that is ethylene and then polythene. Then it can give most of the polyolefins. So, the comparative, if you see here, 100 tons give about one ton per day of hydrogen through the electrolysis, added all inefficiencies in it, which is the most popular available route today. Now, the same uh, 100 tons gives two tons per day of hydrogen. So, the production capacity is double with municipal solid waste if we go through thermochemical route without involving electrolysis. And the point I wanted to bring to everyone's notice, uh, obviously, is that as a country, we need to focus on some of these aspects. And uh, to conclude, uh, I'm sure I have exhausted, I think, four minutes of my 
time. So, uh, principal solid waste can be effectively converted into power and hydrogen. Now, this is not theory. This is practically what we are doing. So, it is available technologically, techno-commercially. Demonstration projects are already under execution. Municipal solid waste to chemicals, the possibilities are enormous. Technology are proven in different stages, but commercially viable solutions at smaller scales is a challenge. Uh, one may have 1,000 tons per day of methanol plant available from open market technologies, but to get a 10 tons per day of methanol plant with uh, you know, syngas having nitrogen, is a difficult challenge technically as well as commercial. The catalysts that are developed are working at a higher pressure of conversion. We are looking at if we can lower the pressures, our entire economics can be supported on a smaller scale. To the extent this can be a MSME project, one small scale industry can make 50 to 100 tons per day of biomass-based briquettes or principal solid waste-based briquettes to chemical in a small uh, area of maybe one acre of industrial land. And that is something which will give boost because either hydrogen will be the main product or hydrogen will be a byproduct. Purification of hydrogen can subsequently be done. And uh, that's And that final stage of purification is not going to be uh, very complicated. Now, this can resolve multiple issues related to sustainability, like pollution due to municipal solid waste, uh, land availability blocked by municipal solid waste, decentralized economical growth of power generation and hydrogen generation. I think most of the issues Dr. Dasapa was uh, mentioning can be addressed by this root of making the most out of uh, our principal solid waste to convert them to hydrogen or to convert them into other products like chemical products. So I take your uh, I, I take your leave for the day and I'm available for the panel discussion of course but the presentation was just to bring out the enormous possibilities what Dr. Dasgupta made we are making our little way to actually commercially execute such projects. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, over to you, Pawanji, for the next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deshpande. I think um, it's good to see that something practically has happened. So let's move with the next uh, speaker, Anandita, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deshpande. Uh, would request Dr. Kiara Zinoro, uh, could you please go ahead with your presentation? Hello. Let me just share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, fantastic. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me uh, today. It's, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Um, so I work for the um, REA. Um, and just to give you a very short background about the REA, we are the largest trade association uh, in the UK promoting renewable energy and clean technologies. Uh, we are a not-for-profit uh, with over 550 members, and basically we represent the range of, of technologies. We have members including energy utilities, developers of multiple technologies or, or more uh, you know, innovative niche technology companies and consultancies as well. Um, and we do represent quite a lot of members across the bioenergy sector. So we have biogas, other green gases, hydrogen. We represent biomass heat, biomass power, energy from, from waste uh, and so on. 
So just to give you a, a short um, background, to give you some, some context on the bioenergy sector in the UK, the bioenergy sector in the UK has, has seen a significant growth over the last uh, decade. In fact, uh, the contribution of bioenergy to the total UK energy supply is more than doubled over the, the past 10 years. But biomass power still remains the largest uh, producer of renewable power in the UK uh, behind offshore and onshore wind. 12.6% uh, of total UK electricity was in fact generated from biomass in 2020. And these uh, figures come from our uh, bioenergy strategy that we published in 2019. Um, sorry, let me just move the bar deck. So, um, okay, so uh, just to say that the biomass growth in the power sector uh, has been driven in particular by uh, government subsidies that have been a gov government support mechanism that have been um, encouraging and supporting the generation of low carbon electricity in the UK, such as renewable obligation uh, before 2017, and then later on a uh, contract for difference, which basically provides a, a strike a strike price in pounds per megawatt hour to um, generators uh, that enable the build of these projects uh, at an acceptable rate of, of return. Um, so um, our government is uh, really supportive of, of bioenergy. Uh, is a key uh, bioenergy will definitely play a, a key role to meet net zero, but. Uh, for our government and for the UK, the key question is uh, recognizing that biomass, the sustainable biomass, is a limited resource. Where should it be prioritized? Where should it be directed? What are the best uses for biomass that can deliver the greatest greenhouse gases emission savings? And our government um, highlighted very clearly in the uh, recent biomass policy statement that was released before Christmas that really uh, biomass should only be combined with carbon capture and storage, first of all, going forward. Um, and it should be directed to um, segments of the economy that are really hard to decarbonize, really hard to, to abate. Uh, and that really is in line with the recommendation of our Climate Change Committee, which is the independent body that uh, um, advises government on climate change policies. The Climate Change Committee has said that from mid 2030s to 2050s, the role of biomass is, is expected to be focused on bioenergy, but with carbon capture and storage, so where the carbon is fully uh, captured and uh, utilized or, or sequestered, uh, and then should be applied across a number of applications, including um, industry, particularly hard to abate sectors of the industry, and transport, and particular, particularly aviation and, and power, but combined with CCS, and also uh, with particular focus on hydrogen production production and also production of aviation fuels. So the, the, there are a number of policies that the UK government is designing and, and developing to support uh, biomass to hydrogen production. Um, I'll mention some briefly. So the hydrogen strategy from, from the UK was released uh, on the 17th of August. The government see the um, electrolytic pathway uh, together with a, a blue hydrogen pathway as uh, the key to largest pathways to produce hydrogen. But they also see other potential pathways such as, for example, production of hydrogen from bioenergy with carbon capture and, and storage. In particular, in the uh, analysis that they've um, undertaken to support the hydrogen strategy in the UK, they uh, anticipate that BEC's hydrogen could supply between 50 and 100 terawatt hour of hydrogen by 2050. Um, the um, timing and scale of, of, of these um, supply could depend on a number of factors, such factors such as the uh, availability of sustainable biomass, which is really from, you know, critical to the development of BEC's uh, hydrogen in, in the UK. Uh, and also the commercial availability of, of this technology. And with the hydrogen strategy, the government is also uh, um, designing a, a low carbon hydrogen standard. It is also very important to define what... <laughs>
low carbon hydrogen and also they are, they are um, developing uh, producer led subsidies to support investment in uh, low carbon hydrogen production the other important policy uh, for the uk that is being designed uh, although it's a very early stage is the policy on greenhouse gas removals because as, as has already been mentioned by previous speakers bioenergy um back with carbon capture and storage is, is seen as critical to deliver net negative emissions so is regarded as a greenhouse gas removal technologies and, and these technologies we know are going to be very important going forward to uh, offset residual carbon emissions from um sectors of the of the energy and the economy that are really difficult to decarbonize such as aviation for example or uh, you know heavy industry or agriculture um and um, so they are designing a, a policy that will um, uh, recognize and uh, incentivize deployment in greenhouse gas removals technologies such as BEX hydrogen. Uh, the other important policy that has been developed is the policy that um, is aimed at decarbonizing aviation, really hard to decarbonize, as, as I said. Uh, the government is um, sees sustainable aviation fuels as uh, an important part for, of decarbonizing aviation and they set out uh, an ambition to 10% of aviation fuels to be from sustainable aviation fuels by 2030. And they also injected significant cash funding uh, to support the development of projects that will produce sustainable aviation fuels. And hydrogen from biomass can be an intermediate byproduct to produce sustainable aviation fuels. And then we have a number of existing policies that are in place. We, we have Contra for Difference, which uh, again uh, it supports um, the power production from, for example, energy from waste facilities, so biomass gasification plant, for example, uh, that generate power, um, and also a renewable transport fuel obligation, which uh, is the main government support mechanism to decarbonize transport and also support uh, biomass to hydrogen projects. Um, the government has recently uh, um, reviewed, commissioned a review of adv adv uh, sorry, advanced gasification technologies in, in the UK because they see a key role in gasification of waste and biomass across all the policies that I just mentioned. And the review um, states that the primary opportunity for this technology is as a, as a means of producing low carbon hydrogen and also hydrocarbon products. And also there is a unique opportunity, as I already said, to deliver uh, net negative uh, emissions when it's combined with carbon capture and, and storage. But although there are some opportunities, I like also to highlight some of the challenges, some of the barriers that were highlighted in this review. So none of the gasification technologies that were reviewed in the UK, and there are about 12, 12 companies developing technologies, mainly thermochemical, that are only being tested, really. None of them is actually currently commercially available. And in addition to that, the uh, 30 projects that have already been um, planned and developed to generate power in the past, so the 30 energy from waste facility based on gasification, this review has found that um, most of them are not actually operating. They never were commissioned, or they operate for a short time scale. And there were really engineering and technical challenges, really, because of the high complexity of, of these systems. So our government, um, as was mentioned by the first speaker, actually is um, supporting further innovation. Um, and they recently launched uh, the Hydrogen Bex Innovation Program that is specifically looking at uh, innovation in R&D um, to um, help really scaling up and uh, commercialize these, these projects. Just wanted to highlight another route, uh, in addition to, to gasification, that also was highlighted previously, uh, which we see has a significant potential in the UK, the biogas to hydrogen conversion route. So there was a, a member of, of the REA called Biotech. They uh, provide a technology which is a, a small scale steam methane reforming, a modular system that can be uh, retrofitted or, uh, at AD plant, anaerobic digestion plants, and can convert 
uh, biomethane to, um, to biomass derived hydrogen. Um, again, with a significant potential to deliver net negative uh, emissions, especially when the um, biomethane is from waste or, or you know, slurry is uh, agricultural residues, for example, is a more um, decentralized and small scale solution compared to the gasification plants that we've seen uh, previously. Uh, so just really to, to conclude, uh, in the UK, the, the has been, um, a, a, there is still, he still is a significant shift in the policy landscape from the focus on biomass power uh, plant to other applications, particularly biomass to hydrogen or uh, biomass to aviation fuels. Uh, to help decarbonize really hard to abate sectors of the, of the economy uh, and in particular in combination with uh, carbon capture and, and storage and in line with net zero objectives there are some key policy being developed in the in the uk to support uh, the, this sector and we see there is a significant potential but there are also some further barriers particularly technical uh, engineering and commercial barriers that need to be addressed before we can unlock uh, the full potential of, of, of this sector and uh, yeah thank you very much that's all from me thank you thank you dr zanaro um, that was a very insightful presentation uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Uh, Ramachandran from DC Power to please uh, go ahead with his presentation. And I will uh, also sound uh, the bell uh, at four minutes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zanero, I think you need to stop sharing your screen. Okay, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, Mr. Ramachandran. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah can you see the, my presentation material? Yes, we can. Uh, we can okay. See. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Just a brief introduction about us. Decentralized energy systems, private India, private limited, more popularly known as Desi Power, was founded in the year 1996 by two technocrat visionaries, and it focuses on creating a rural India through power through green power for economic and social development. To have adequate quantities of agro residues and waste available for clean cooking and also for electricity generation for pumping irrigation water and other productive activities. Now, the other requirement is hybridization of this power generation system to meet the reliability and socioeconomic viability criteria. Fortunately, today we have technologies and equipment which are not a, a barrier for large scale commercialization. But the question is now whether new solutions are needed due to the requirements to meet decarbonization, pollution control, resource constraints, and other economic criteria. And the question that we would like to pose is whether hydrogen can be a viable component of a hybrid renewable energy based microgrid? If so, how? Desi Power built its first uh, microgrid, hybrid uh, uh, microgrid in the year 2015. This is just a representation of a typical microgrid with hybrid power plants comprising of a gasified gasification based gas engine power plant and a PV field and with an electric uh, with a battery bank. This is an illustration of the same thing with including <coughs> excuse me the fuel cell which can power <laughs> The rural, the rural uh, towers, which so that they can be free 
from the use of diesel and also the lot battery banks. This is simulation modeling, and I don't go to the details for paucity of time, because we know that we, from our experience, it shows that many of the, high, the hybrid microgrids are not making any money for various reasons. One major reason is that they are operate, most of them are operating under variation. With the load pattern is very different at different times of the day and also with, with various seasons. So there's no one universal solution which is applicable for all uh, villages. Each has got to be tailor-made. And this, to address this issue, we have taken up a simulation modeling tool using the Winsim tool in, uh, along with the, the University of North Dakota. This shows the typical simulation modeling result, which can be interpreted. And uh, we, this will be a good tool work, uh, for making, uh, making decisions. Our conclusions are hydrogen will be an important renewable secondary energy source for the net zero emission scenario envisaged in the year 2000 by 2050. Now, a strategic plan for the decentralized sector should be formulated by a consortium comprising of promoters, users, R&D institutions, and equipment suppliers, and they have to seek support, government institutions, and industry to start a program to build and test prototypes and pilot plants and adapt hydrogen production and utilizing technologies for smaller capacities and rating, and build pilot hybrid power plants incorporating hydrogen and servicing a microgrid, and formulate framework for large scale replication on the basis of the results of the pilot program. And incentives should be provided to ensure that critical technologies achieve commercialization and hydrogen can become an affordable for a wide range of applications. Desi Power is interested in exploring ideas with prospective partners and use its expertise and experience to jointly formulate a plan of action, to develop, test, and commercialize decentralized hybrid renewable energy power plants producing hydrogen and servicing microgrid. Thank you for the opportunity given to me for to share our thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Ramachandran. Uh, can I request you to stop sharing your screen? Sure. Thank you. We also have Mr. Hachin Sharan, who is the chairman of Desi Power. So uh, Mr. Sharan, if you could quickly share some of your thoughts on today's discussion and what would be the vision to really uh, move towards a bigger deployment of you know, um, hydrogen based on biomass. So over to you, sir. You are on mute, if you could unmute yourself. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I've been working in the biomass to power and energy since 1990. It's a very large local resource, which can be harnessed to change the social and economic status of our villages. As you've heard from Dr. Dasapa earlier, it has not happened. Uh, it remains uh, the use of biomass for productive and social and economic purposes is vastly underutilized and vastly misutilized in our country. Desi Power has been working in this field since 1991, 1996, but we have started the work with Professor Mukunda and Dr. Dasappa way back. And Desi Power in the meantime has built more than 60 power stations. You might have seen the picture of uh, the Swiss uh, power station, which was also built by, built, designed, built, and operated for a while by our group in Switzerland. Thanks to the technologies that have been developed and the prototype and the experience from this sector, biomass is, as I said, a source of energy and social development 
which has not been utilized in our country for a variety of reasons. Our 65 plants, a total of maybe 200 plants in India are peanuts in the context of the needs of our rural sector. The renewable power supply is one of the basic goals of a decentralized power system with microgrid. Depending only on biomass, it is a very, it becomes more uneconomical to ensure 24 times seven availability over the entire year. So we have gone on and hybridized uh, biomass with photovoltaic systems, and we have been running the first microgrid since 2006. The microgrids can be made profitable only if the power is used mostly for profitable and energy service applications. Depending on lighting and small loads to, to run a microgrid can never make them profitable. That's the experience of India, that's the experience all over the world and in, in Africa. Many, most of the microgrids will only become profitable if we are able to plan and optimize it for the local conditions. Decentralized power is not a standard power package that you take out of your drawer and build it at some place and it will work. The conditions from the point of view of demand side, conditions of resources, conditions of infrastructure, conditions of the people and financial conditions are all different in different parts of the country. We have therefore learned that a more inclusive local planning is absolutely essential for to make uh, decentralized renewable energy based energy systems viable on a very large scale, socially, economically, and ecologically. Simulation and modeling techniques are now a state of the art. They are used for optimizing, analyzing, optimizing, and giving options to the decision makers to choose the solutions which suit their goals the best. It is a, it's, it's used for complex systems, but please believe me that a decentralized microgrid using a variety of renewable energy resources is also an extremely complex system. We have therefore gone ahead and together with partners in India and in the US, developed the simulation and modeling packages for optimizing microgrids together with the productive loads which are included in that system. The advantages of this would be that a local optimization will ensure that the risks of the investors are minimized. And that's one of the routes in which we can go to maximize the replication of these technologies. I have at the moment uh, now um, the big, big challenge that we have here is of course that um, how do we bring hydrogen as a secondary energy source in the decentralized hybrid energy sector? Is it at all viable from all different angles? If it is viable, is it viable at the scale of ratings and sizes at the, the, in, at the decentralized lecture se sector? Is it better for us to design a hydrogrid with hydrogen in bottles, which we get from the large plants which are done, but then you have the problem of, uh, of uh, transportation and costs to be included in that? Or do we generate hydrogen at site? Are a small size electrolyzers viable economically? So these are all issues which we are very tempted to take up today. And take it in such a way that it does not exclude decentralized systems without hydrogen, but wherever it's viable, let's do it together with hydrogen. It opens up the whole area of decarbonization, the transition to the new uh, economic, social, and uh, ecological situation, not only in India, but all over the developing countries. So we'll be more than happy 
to interact with any group in India. And of course, I'm looking at Dr. Dasappa, my old mentor in the gasification field, uh, to see whether we can once again take a technology from the lab and make it viable commercially, ecologically, and uh, ecologically. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sharon. I think uh, you bring a very interesting point on um, the commercialization. Can I, if I ask um, um, all speakers to um, turn on their um, videos, Professor Dasappa, uh, Mr. Ramachandran, Rajesh, yeah, Dr. Kiara. So I'll start with a few questions. I think we have about 20 minutes. And um, Anura, can you just spotlight on the speakers, uh, please? I think I'll have to make you the host. So just one second. Yeah. So I think I'll start with you, Dr. Dasapai. I mean, we have heard, I think let's make next 20, 25 minutes, there are a lot of questions from the panelists, uh, from the attendees, sorry, to really understand. So first I'll uh, start with you. I think what is the rate that we are thinking um, when we compare to electrolysis in terms of production of one kg of um, hydrogen that how much would it really cost? Do we have any estimates in terms of um, the cost production when we compare to electrolysis? And um, do we have really any commercial players today who can really build own and you know the boot uh, of this technology itself at a scale that we are really talking about, given that the National Hydrogen Mission could be announced any moment now? Yeah, uh, thank you. I think uh, on the chat, many of the questions which were asked, I have been able to reply to them. A few would be very useful to, to have some discussions like you. Thanks for bringing up this one. The electrolysis, when you really look at, there are there are paper articles, people say that it can be less than 100 rupees when you look at 2 rupees per kilowatt hour as the solar electricity, which in reality is, is not true. People have done a lot of exercise on this. If you really look at the entire thing, they, they say there's nothing less than 400 rupees per, per kg is what you can get if you really look at everything. And uh, if the other question which is coming up to scale is, yes, uh, uh, I think all of you know that the largest capacity is being tried out for electrolysis across the globe now. And people who have been talking about is no more than about 200 kg per hour of hydrogen is what they can really look at. I think that's all the maximum capacity they have been looking at. Uh, I don't know whether there is already existing in, in this country right now. I have no idea. This is something which I have been told about. Keeping that in mind, we at IIC have put things together. Probably we are currently comparable to an SMR cost if you really look at. We are anywhere in the range of about uh, 300 rupees plus minus 50 kind of situation with respect to biomass. This is a, at least uh, this is the big issue when we start scratch. Probably if we have many industries coming in and trying to do at large scale, definitely there's going to be a synergy in terms of bringing down the cost. On that, there is no doubt at all. And on the energy basis, we are not very far off in terms of uh, overall conversion, like what uh, I should say, an SMR process, and we are trying to do that. Means today we have put the process conditions in such a way that we are pretty uh, efficient in terms of conversion process. Thank you. Sorry. Anyone wants to add anything specifically to this topic, I would also request to keep your response really short. So anyone wants to add anything yeah, to what? Yeah, Mr. Thing, Deshman. I mean, uh, electrolysis, we are looking at 50 units of electricity per kg of hydrogen. Now, the cost of hydrogen uh, is primarily cost of electrical energy and of course the cost of water and handling the other part and the capital cost. So the electricity cost from different routes, if we compare on a 24 seven availability basis, probably municipal solid waste, we can look at between five rupees per unit kind of electricity cost. Solar, we can look at two rupees. So the cost by electrolysis is not going to be anywhere less than uh, 300 rupees plus minus 50 like Dr. Dasapa said. So, that could be a benchmark starting point for the cost of hydrogen, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, interesting, Mr. Deshpande. Uh, thank you for bringing this. Yeah, Mr. Sharon, quick response, please. Yeah. Uh, the point I would like to make is that this talk about two rupees per kilowatt hour PV cost is not real for the consumer. 
It's based on a 25-year payback period of the capital. It's cheap capital that's being used there. And that type of financing is not available for decentralized power stations of any type in India or elsewhere. So these numbers, when we are comparing about the cost of electricity for whatever purpose, let's be realistic about it. So you raise a fair point, but then when we look at it from a policy uh, maker's perspective, I think um, they are taking into what is really available to them and the market price, whether it is with policy, with subsidies, without subsidies, with a longer payback period, all that uh, is fine. But I think the challenge is that when we are talking about making it competitive in the market, the co obvious comparison is to electrolysis. You know, I also want to put this before the uh, panelists that we have heard about roughly about 60 gigawatt of, you know, electrolyzer capacity being announced. And I think more than 15 to 20 countries globally have really talked about their hydrogen mission and everyone is talking about electrolysis and it's looking almost being as if that is really going to drive the hydrogen journey. Any reactions around this? Let me bring um, Dr. Guncha. What do you think? Have you, you have heard of all the panelists here? Um, any quick reaction and then uh, Professor Dasapa, I'll get back to you. Yeah. Well, it's true that everyone is talking about electrolysis, but I think India being an uh, you know, agro-based country, we should not leave the biomass thing behind. We can continue with the electrolysis thing, but we should also uh, take uh, biomass as we have discussed uh, in this long session into uh, account, which can produce hydrogen at a comparative way. Like if, if it is coming nearly as what uh, hydrogen production cost, cost as steam methane, def, uh, de, methane deforming process. So yes, we should obviously take it. And obviously we will use uh, so much surplus of biomass, which is available in India. And also the, it will actually add up on the cost of farmers also. It, it will be helpful for farmers also so that they can uh, use the residue to some uh, useful products like hydrogen. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Dasipa. Yeah, uh, thank you. See, there are two things. At one end, we want to have a clean uh, uh, climate uh, issues wherein the country has gone and committed to various things. If we don't handle the biomass the way it has to be handled so that we recover the energy, the entire perspective with which you we keep blaming saying that the Punjab burning is creating a problem for Delhi. I'm not trying to say that with this we'll be able to solve everything, but at least they should be attempted. You just go back to what solar did. 17 rupees per kilowatt was, was the kind of supporting price which it got. Biomass has never realized. That's why I'm calling it as a level playing field has to be brought in. You nurture this industry, definitely things will happen. And I would like to just urge and request the groups like you should be able to take this message across various agencies. This is what, in solar, there are n number of people who are talking on behalf of solar. It's just none doing it for biomass. Anytime we go, we tell, we tell, no, no, you guys are research, you want to push your programs. No, the country needs this kind of situation. We need to handle our residue. I think that's where we need key players like you to take the message across. And we are all there to support technology. Technology is available. Like any other country, this also has to negotiate certain uh, processes which have happened, but if you don't provide the necessary opportunities, technology will never grow in this country. Fair enough. Let me bring Dr. Kiara in. I'll come to you, uh, Mr. Sharon and Mr. Desh Pandey. But Dr. Kiara, is there a leaf that we can borrow from UK's journey that we clearly see that in their policy, they are setting that we want to generate hydrogen from biomass and they're setting certain targets. They're setting certain policies. Is that the direction India should take? Yes, so just to say, I think uh, even in the UK, I mean, the, 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 the key pathways that are really driving the discussions are electrolytic hydrogen uh, and blue hydrogen, at least for the hydrogen production policy framework. But as I said, the, the really the, the, key, the key point about uh, biomass derived hydrogen is that when combined with CCS, uh, so without CCS, it can still deliver 
uh, hydrogen low carbon as low carbon as, as green hydrogen and when it's combined with CCS in addition to that it can deliver ne negative emissions and because the world will need uh, negative emission, we will need to remove to a certain extent some, some CO2 from the atmosphere to offset any emissions that we cannot uh, abate, then I think that's, you know, where uh, biomass derived hydrogen will really play a, an important role. And uh, yeah, as I said, I think that area is really emerging and, and, and started to draw a lot of attention in, in the UK. And there will be policy that will be developed to uh, to drive that, that forward. And, and there will be probably some uh, support mechanism to um, uh, encourage private, private investment and uh, deployment of um, uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage for hydrogen production. There's a lot of innovation funding that has been um, uh, deployed to, to help uh, developing and commercializing these technologies. And, uh, and ultimately, you know, there will be other policies such as emission trading uh, schemes and carbon pricing that will also help um, supporting uh, any technology that can deliver negative emissions such as you know biomass to, to hydrogen so i think that would be my 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 lesson that we learned from the uk thank you for sharing that uh, yeah mr deshpande quick response uh, quick response are three parts to it part number one biomass is not free there is a cost to biomass uh, india is consuming every on a day-to-day -day basis thousands of tons of biomass per day so it is not that biomass is commercially not used or uh, exploited. It is used today and to an extent that there is a scarcity of biomass for thermal energy application in most of the areas. Biomass is not used because it is commercially unviable compared to coal. Coal is more commercially viable, so biomass is not used. Uh, biomass aggregation, point number two, biomass aggregation facilities, whatever we are looking at, there must be a commercial trading entity. Like we have an energy exchange for electricity. There must be a marketplace, a platform where biomass can be bought and sold. And that should be available electronically. That should be an available where futures can be traded. If the futures are traded, farmers are encouraged to have biomass grown for energy farming. And we did this exercise for energy farming in some remote areas of Tamil Nadu, where uh, near Tutikorin, where the cost of energy farming cashewina trees uh, was coming out to be around two and a half rupees a kg, when otherwise biomass based briquettes were available at four and a half to five rupees a kg. So that was point number two. And point number three biomass needs to be decentralized. Now we are aggregating biomass, briquetting it, and then distributing it. Biomass on an average transfers or it is transported around 700 to 1000 kilometers every time. So uh, for every use, the biomass available to the end user has traveled at least 1000 kilometers, 700 to 1000 kilometers. And the cost of biomass includes at least 30% cost of diesel which is used for transportation so the biomass cost does include that and decentralized power uh, or decentralized hydrogen generation unless we have that biomass to energy cannot be commercialized now just to add to it the last perspective if we, we substitute, yeah. yeah if we substitute biomass with municipal solid waste all of these issues are addressed and the only issue that we need to address is additionally technology issue Municipal solid waste is commercially available with municipalities. So there is a nodal agency. Quick point, Mr. Point. Deshpande. Yeah. There is a cost which is negligible. Third, there is an incentive from the environmental perspective to use it. And third, it is available pan India across the globe in abundant quantity. Thank you. So we understand that, but I think, see, MSW is available, it's, um, their parent, I think everyone gets it, but it's question is, is technology at scale and commercially viable? I think that is a discussion we want to understand. Uh, Mr. Sharon, you wanted to quickly respond. Yes. Um, I would also uh, request, uh, we have last 10 minutes, so if we can click quick, quick pointers, I want to take up a couple minutes. of thoughts. Yeah. I'll take more than two minutes. The most important point, point we must realize is that we have solutions on the ground today 
where biomass in the local context is economically viable. But there are no investments because there is a whole lack of an integrated planning of energy, employment, farming, and ecology, decarbonization. The decarbonization of any sector can be done cheapest by using the biomass locally. Local decarbonization has to be linked to national decarbonization. You look at the policy framework of UK, you look at the policy framework of um, the European Union, you have to look at these aspects completely and where the subsidies should be provided. We should not provide subsidy for importing LS, LSG and use it for cooking purposes, which is a complete, to my view, when we can compete with the LPG, with biomass pellets, and energy efficient stoves on the marketplace. But there isn't a framework, there isn't an incentive, there isn't a program. Sorry, that's my view. Today. Thank you. Yeah, I have a set of one, two rounds of questions, and then we'll ask. Divya has raised her hand, so Divya Dhankar, so we can also bring uh, to have the question. But let me ask this: that you know, the biomass power in India has a catchment of roughly fifty to hundred kilometers. So, how would aggregation solve um, challenges be solved? I think that's uh, one part of the question, and the other uh, part of the question is also that. What are the impurities associated with hydrogen that is generated through biomass? And what are the best feedstocks for biomass conversion to hydrogen? So I'll start with you, Professor Dasapa, and uh, other panelists. Please feel free to jump in and um, add to what uh, add to this discussion. Yeah. The last question uh, first. Uh, with respect to impurity, it all depends on the technology. What one is trying to really look at. In fact. The slide what I showed you, we have been almost close to reaching the requirements of uh, automotive fuel requirements. It's a very stringent requirement of reaching 99.97 and 0 0.03 is all contaminants at PPB levels. Today we have been able to make an evaluation of these this gas, and uh, I suppose in a short time we should see some demonstration plant or operational on this one. Maybe can I get back to your first question which you raised? I think I just sort of missed it a little bit because. Why no, I was talking about aggregation that we're talking about a catchment area of 50 to 100. Yeah, I think, see, especially when people have done a lot of economics uh, with respect to both in terms of uh, capturing the biomass and trying to see how it can be distributed, people have found about uh, a few tens of kilometers would be very, very economical. There is an extensive study done on ethanol requirements by various groups across the country. I think when we try to really look at that one, many of these technologies will really put into those, those aspects of generating and trying to see how you will be able to deal with in terms of local distribution. Beyond that, I think we will have various other mechanisms to take care of hydrogen water generate to be taken forward in terms of other storage mechanisms. But I think if I do not want to bring in too many imponderables, this is what has been happening on biomass always. Just try to prove that we will be able to showcase something happening in this country. All others will follow. Now, if you put n number of barriers, we are not able to cross this one. That's how the power generation got killed. I do not want to see this happening. <laughs> and I would like to see that this can take off. Absolutely right, sir. Thank you, Professor Dasapa. Yeah. Divya, we have brought in you as a panelist. Do you want to um, unmute and turn on your video and ask the question, Divya Dhankar? Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity, Pavan. Um, is it, I, I hope it's okay if I do not turn my uh, video on. Sure, sure, but because, please move it with yes. your question. We, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, I um, had already uh, posed this to Mr. Uh, to Dr. Dasapa and also to all the other panelists uh, here today. Um, I am trying, kind of struggling with the idea of uh, emissions, the carbon emissions from biomass being used for this particular application. And uh, I am trying to figure out uh, when we say that, yes, we are going to use it uh, for this particular application and we are able to employ some kind of carbon uh, capture technology uh, towards the um, end of the life cycle of the technology uh, or, or the production of hydrogen. 
um, how does that impact uh, the overall cost parameters that will make it uh, a viable option for uh, you know consideration in the whole energy mix that we have as of now? I yeah. hope I was Thank clear. You. Yeah, Professor Lassapa. Uh, see, basically biomass, when you really look at it, it's already a CO2 neutral technology. And whenever we are trying to promote, I think that word sustainability, which people have been talking about, I, we need to really make sure that we draw a line depending upon how much is available, how much utilized. Worst situation is whether you can grow biomass. This is how we need to really look at. Once you do that, I think many of the calculations have shown it's a negative. You can fix carbon into the soil uh, compared to what is happening with various other technologies when you go through biomass to hydrogen. I think the work here and elsewhere has shown that, yes, it is going to be a very, very enabling mechanism. The CO2 what is going to be generated can be further utilized if, you, if depending upon the process of who, are, who is generating this technology. If CO2 is available, it can bring in value addition so that you can replace the CO2 from fossil fuel. I think this, this has a lot more potential. It's not going to harm the environment as long as we can use it sustainably. I think this is the message which should go strong and clear. Because biomass today, if you generate something, you put CO2, whether you use it or not, it becomes CO2. Here we are trying to generate something so that we can replace something which is coming from fossil fuels, which will help in terms of making sure that this is going to offset certain CO2 from other, other emissions. Biomass is, and the CO2 generated, it gets fixed because of the plant growth. And, and if you use agro residues in general, probably I think we'll, we'll make sure that none of these questions be, uh, really arise when we really look at environment definition. Yeah, Rajesh, you want yeah, to quickly, add? Uh, quickly, I add to it. So we have used biomass for good effect uh, uh, in actual practice to generate uh, up to power through the engine route also gasification. Now, one of the point is CO2 has a large market in the fertilizer industry today because the route which we are using for fertilizer making methane SMR is having CO2 shortage in the urea making process. So we have at one hand uh, ammonia surplus uh, fertilizer plants, all, all the fertilizer plants, the industry. So there is a good demand for CO2 in the urea making process. Secondly, the urea which is, uh, sorry, the CO2 which is generated and captured can be put to different uses which presently we are missing. In the sense, we have to generate CO2 by combustion for use in different processes, chemical processes, what I mean. Now, that is something like sodium carbonate. We are missing out. We are, we are making CO2 by a, by a process and then using it for sodium carbonate, for calcium carbonate. So, for making these chemicals, we are actually combusting fuel and making carbon dioxide. And then there are CO2 absorption power. So, if CO2 is available from these routes, and these are large complexes for inorganic chemicals. Like when we make soda ash, we require CO2. And that is done by actually combustion. So we can eliminate all these combustions and reduce the overall uh, impact of CO2 emission on the sustainability perspective. Yeah, Mr. Deshpande, I think the point is fair enough that there is enough use for CO2 and we should um, use um, in the industry, parallel industries. Fair. We have got Akshay in. Akshay, you want to turn your video quickly and ask your question? Akshay, get what? Hello? Yeah, Akshay, go ahead. I yeah. Sorry, I have logged from, logged in from a... Okay, that's fine. Uh, just, jump to, just jump to your uh, question. Yeah. So, I, I don't have a question per se, but uh, I can say that we have discussed much about the biomass and... Uh, the aggregation, the challenges we have. So we at a biofuel circle. So we are working with farmers and uh, FPOs locally uh, for, on aggregation model. So they, so it also has a seasonality issue. So how we can uh, tackle that? So the FPOs can store, they can they can aggregate and they can supply the raw biomass, and that will definitely help uh, this uh, biomass to hydrogen uh, sector. Uh, it, definitely in the aggregation, collection, supply. So, so we have the solution that India is moving uh, also in that direction. Sure. So thank you, Akshay, for that comment. Uh, Anurag, if you can bring in Priyank Shah to ask the question and uh, we can move Akshay to the attendee list.
yeah priyank please go ahead uh, you'll have to unmute and ask your question priyank hello yeah yeah my question is to dr dasappa sir that we are into an era where we india we are also seeing uh, lots of ways to energy project means from ways to they are generating electricity is going on and government is also pushing such kind of project so uh, for say for biomass waste as well as uh, msw waste and the new era which we are talking about is from waste to hydrogen uh, I, according um, from my side i want to ask you sir which one is uh, more better for no reducing on uh, emission side or for say helpful to environment according to you unmute yourself sir professor dasappa you are on mute dasappa sir unmute yourself sorry uh, uh, uh. biomass to power people have been doing this and only in the co generation sector people have become successful unless until you have your own captive power requirement people have been able to do it. otherwise we want to generate sell it there is a niche application which people are trying to do because the kind of revenues what you generate by doing all these things people have found it difficult to make sure it's economically sustainable msw yes there is going to be a very very important area yes. people generate electricity unfortunately the current enabling mechanisms which are there in terms of meeting emissions have led very few groups to deal with msw to electricity because the emission norms and the super uh, i mean uh, supreme court's order has put a sort of a hold on various technologies which can come in because of the dioxins and furons i think this has put a hold here we are trying to see that if we can bring in value addition for for every kg of msw through this route better than power probably the success rate will be much much higher it could be hydrogen or any downstream chemical i think that is what is being explored there is definitely all the research and certain activities has shown that there is a possibility to do that i think this would be a very good way to bring in industries to participate to make sure that there is enough return on investments what they try to put yeah um i think uh, to uh, it's over 90 minutes and it's almost now getting to 2 hours and it's a debate and a topic of interest that will continue and i think the pathway is very very clear that uh, we need to move forward with policies that really support this and i think uh, professor dasappa you have also highlighted the role of organizations like wri uh, on what we should be really also contributing in this ecosystem but i would really walk across every uh, panelist so um, mr rajesh uh, desh pandey any last one liner that you want to really share uh, just keep it like literally 20 20 seconds for each speaker so over to you sir yeah uh, thanks uh, and uh, the last line is that municipal solid waste or biomass to electricity are no more academic concepts they are actually on ground executed hydrogen generation via uh, electricity generation route is physically happening there is a huge potential and there is a role for every sector every participant every stakeholder to play and it is a big opportunity for india to move in this direction collaboratively biomass oblique municipal solid waste to hydrogen is going to be a future and we must all believe that like what we are working on ground it will demonstrate in next 5 years and there is a huge demand for it thank you thank you dr guncha uh, well uh, electrolysis is going to be going to give a tough competition to biomass gasification so india be is an agro based uh, country we look forward to research and research institutes and industries that how they can take over hydrogen production via you know gasification route or steam gasification route so that act, uh, we can give a big competition to electrolysis and uh, uh, government should uh, you know think about policies which will be beneficial for biomass to hydrogen production thank you mr sharan what i would like to make is that biomass technology today gasification power and uh, application at village levels is economically viable 
it has been proven that its data, it's, uh, it's uh, reliable and hybridized with, uh, with uh, PV, we are able to meet the criteria of 24 seven availability, affordability and uh, economic and ecological sustainability. The big point here is for us to have a framework where the investors see the risk of investing in the rural sector on a large scale. How can their risk be reduced? And to do that, there has to be work done from our side to do much more intensive planning at the local levels to show to the investors what his options are and where his money is going to be at the minimum risk. At the same time, this type of work, which has to be done on a district level, because you have to optimize it locally. Biomass, you cannot opti optimize on a national level. So for that, if we do that, then we have to have a policy framework where the policies from Delhi, the policies from the state governments have to match with the needs, what is required for the local social and economic development. And in that, biomass in India can play a very vital role. And it's an illusion to think that we can decarbonize India through the PV route. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sharon. Dr. Kiara. Yes, thank you. I will be very short just to say that um, I'm very, very happy to collaborate with, um, well, all, all the, you know, industry in India and WRI um, going forward to share the lessons learned uh, in, in the UK, um, because, yes, I think it's very important to, to have the right policy framework um, in place and our policy uh, levers or, or incentives are not necessarily perfect. So obviously we, we have learned quite a few lessons there what shouldn't be done. <laughs> uh, but also, you know, we also learn how you need to have the right policy framework in, in place to, you know, help the, the risk in this investment, providing revenue certainty. And uh, and so I'm, I'm very happy to, to share and collaborate for going forward and share our, our lessons um, from the UK. That's fantastic to hear. Any words from uh, Mr. Ramachandra? Very brief, sir. Uh, in, at JC uh, Power, we are dealing with the rural development, and uh, we mostly handle very small capacity uh, power generation systems. We see, we, we find, we think that you know, thermical, uh, thermochemical routes for generation of hydrogen may not be very economical for the small rating. On the other hand, we see that uh, the in situ generation of uh, hydrogen using process and which use the electricity from renewable sources may be economical so that we can uh, avoid the use of uh, the carbon capture utilization and storage facilities which unnecessarily pushing up the cost of hydrogen from fossil fuels thank you mr Rajendra. and dr dasapa uh, the last words with you for this webinar yeah, uh, thanks. I think, first of all, uh, compliments to you and your team to have brought in this, this important area and focus and bringing in so many people. Thanks for all the efforts and the kind of thing. And I think I have said whatever needs to be said. We need to create a level playing field and try to see whether we can. Uh, there are questions saying that how reliable, what needs to be done. Like many other demonstration projects which have gone on with other renewables, also enable something to happen on biomass, see where we stand. And I can tell you in India, we probably on the on these technologies, what we have been working, we can showcase we are leaders across the globe on this platform. That's something which I can vouch and make sure this can happen. Only thing is uh, we need somebody to make sure that this happens through. All of us are working towards that. We will support everybody who wants to come into this sector and we are not trying to say that dethrone any other technologies. No, bringing this also into the context so that people will also can contribute along the same direction. With this, I thank you very much and uh, uh, for an excellent, uh, I should say, platform for sharing all of our experiences. Sure, thank you, sir. I think uh, key messages is global leadership. It is also about technologies coexisting and also from Mr. Sharon, what he mentioned about, you know, to ensure that there is ROI, we are able to answer the investors also. I think a lot of learnings. Thank you, uh, Professor Dasapa, Mr. Desh Pandey, Mr. Ramachandra, Mr. Sharon, Dr. Kiara, Dr. Buncha Munchal and the entire WRI team 
for putting this together. And this is only, a, a, I can assure you all of you and all uh, the panelists that this is only a beginning. And I'm sure there's a lot more conversations and policy initiatives that WRI India would take up. Um, we have already been reaching out to many of you individually and we look for collaboration also from our UK partners. And thank you all the attendees. Uh, we had more than uh, 270 attendees uh, just listening uh, today. And um, we'll be sharing the uh, recorded session and the presentation over the next few days. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.